Okay, so welcome back to this next video on antibiotics uh, which affect um, cell wall biosynthesis in bacteria. Okay, so um, in this video what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at um, how it is that we convert uh, N-acetylmuramyl tripeptide into N-acetylmuramyl pentapeptide. And basically the two amino acids that you add on next are both the same. They are both D-alanine uh, amino acids. So, we need to discuss D-alanine. Now, and in fact, this would be a good place for me to talk a bit more about enantiomerism. So, uh, if we look at the general structure of an amino acid, so let's say here. Okay, so here is an amino acid. Here's the carboxyl group here. Here's the hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon. Here's the amino group going down here. And off this side, you then have the R group. Now, if we actually draw this um, molecule's 3D structure, then we'll put the alpha carbon right at the center there. We'll then put this um, hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon, pointing right up. And this, these two structures are going to be in the same plane as the paper, basically. Okay. We'll then have, uh, let's say, this amino group also in the same plane as the piece of paper. And then we'll have to put the other two groups, the carboxyl group and the R group, they won't be in the same plane as the piece of paper. One of them will be coming, pointing outwards of the page, and one of them will be going into the page, basically. So, let's say we put the carboxyl group here, and that, this is why I hate, um, I should have drawn it the other way around. In fact, let me draw it the other way around. Let me... Um, start this diagram again. So I'll put the amino group here, otherwise we end up having to write the carboxyl group backwards. So everything's still the same. You're in the page. I've just moved this around from there to there. Okay, now that's in the page. Now, one of the groups is going to go away from the plane that the page is in, so it's going to go into the page. You denote that by this dashed line. So let's say that's the carboxyl group. And one of the groups is going to come out of the page towards us, and that's the amino group. Now, that is one of the optical isomers of this... Uh, oh, sorry, not the amino group. We've already had the amino group. Let's say that's the R group. That is one of the optical isomers that you can make for this uh, molecule. Now let me draw the other one. Again, you keep the carbon and the hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon and the amino group in the same plane as the paper. But this time, the group that goes away into the page is the R group, and the group that's coming out of the page at us is going to be the carboxyl group. Are those the same molecule? Well, they have all of the same groups coming off this carbon, but can I actually superimpose that one on there? Can I move this over here and put it on and superimpose it on there? Absolutely not. If you bring this over here, the hydrogen will match up, the carbon will match up, the amino group will match up, but the carboxyl group will be uh, superimposed on this R group, and this R group will be superimposed on this carboxyl group. These are foundationally different molecular structures. These bonds are not just flexible. You cannot just swap those two around. That's not the way it works. The position of this R group on that carbon atom is fixed. It's static, basically. It's rigid. You can't move that, not without breaking this bond, breaking that bond, moving that one there, and moving that one there, which involves a chemical reaction. So not without a chemical reaction can you turn this one into this one. So that's what is meant by different enantiomers. These are enantiomers, or optical isomers of each other. Enantiomers literally means that they're the uh, mirror images of one another. So if this molecule were to look in the mirror, it would see this one looking back at it, basically. Okay, so uh, enantiomers. Right, uh, so um, let me just explain to you how you know whether an enantiomer is dextrorotatory or larvorotatory. So basically, if you imagine looking down, if you imagine sitting where this hydrogen is up here, Okay, and you look at um, the, uh, you're looking down at these three groups, the carboxyl group, the R group, and the amino group, then basically what you can do is you can try and read 
uh, a word, basically. You can try and read a word, corn. So you take the CO from the carboxyl group, you take the R from the R group, and you take the N from the amino group. So the, the CO comes from the carboxyl. The R comes from this R group here, and then the N comes from that amino group over there. Okay, so try and read this word, corn. Basically, what's going to happen is you're going to end up going uh, clockwise around. In this case, your head is going to turn in the clockwise direction. Okay? Now, if your head is having to turn in the clockwise direction, that means that this, this enantiomer of uh, the amino acid is the larvorotatory enantiomer. Okay? Right. Now, if you sit up here as the hydrogen again, and try and read the corn again, then this time, here's the carboxyl group, here's the CO, then here's the R, and then here's the N. This time, your head is going to turn in this direction, basically. And your head is having to turn anti-clockwise in this case. And that, therefore, is the dextro-rotatory enantiomer. Okay, so that's how you tell the difference between whether you are looking at a, a dextrorotatory or an, an alavorotatory enantiomer. Right, okay, so that's a bit of um, enantiomerism. So now let's talk about uh, D-alanine and L-alanine. So the amino acid alanine, let me draw the amino acid structure for alanine. So here's the um, carboxyl group here. Here's the alpha carbon. And then in the case of alanine, you have a methyl group coming off of this alpha carbon, like so. And then an amino group going down here. Okay, so um, this is the structure of alanine. Now you have four different groups coming off this central carbon here. So this is a chiral center, and indeed there are two enantiomers of this molecule. This argument that I've got done up here works perfectly if you put alanine as your, uh, if you put this methyl group as your R group. You have the dextrorotatory and the larvorotatory enantiomers. Okay, so um, there are two enantiomers of alanine. L-alanine is the larvorotatory alanine, and D-alanine stands for the dextrorotatory alanine. Now, um, L-alanine is very, very common in the cytoplasm of cells. D-alanine is not so co common. But you can convert L-alanine to D-alanine through a chemical reaction. And there is an enzyme which catalyzes that reaction, known as alanine um, racemase, basically, or racemase, some people will pronounce it. And basically, what this does is it converts one enantiomer, namely the L enantiomer, into the D enantiomer. Now, once you've got two D alanine um, amino acids, what you can do is you combine them together to create a dipeptide. So you take two D, D alanine groups and you bind them together to make a dipeptide. So I will show this. So um, if this is one alanine here, and I'll just now denote the methyl group by a methyl group, then you're going to link it to the next. Um, the next um, D-alanine for a peptide link. So you're going to have a condensation reaction between the amino group of the first uh, D-alanine and the hydroxyl group of the second D-alanine. Then here's the alpha carbon of the second D-alanine with the um, methyl group coming there, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and then an amino group coming down here. So this is um, the, uh, a dipeptide made out of two alanine molecules, and this molecule is known as D-alanyl, alanyl, uh, D-alanine, basically. So you've got the D-alanyl group bound to a D-alanine. Okay, and um, the enzyme which um, takes two D-alanine molecules and um, produces this D-alanyl, D-alanine group is known as D-alanyl, D-alanine uh, symphotase. Okay, so dialanyl, dialanine symphotase. And the reason I'm telling you the names of all these enzymes is because there are there is a drug which blocks them basically. So dialanyl, dialanine uh, symphotase. Okay, we'll come back to the drug that blocks them in just a minute. Right. So 
uh, diavanyl dialanine synthetase takes two dialanine um, uh, amino acids and binds them together to make a dipeptide, which is the dialanyl dialanine molecule. Now what you do is you bind this dialanyl uh, dialanine molecule to this uh, carboxyl terminal. Uh, well, this carboxyl terminus of um, the um, n acetyl muramyl tripeptide, and that will create us the n acetyl muramyl pentapeptide. So we are going to take this amino group here, and we are going to link that to this carboxyl group here. So take off this hydroxyl group from this carboxyl group and put on this amino group here. Right. Then you've got the alpha carbon of uh, one of the dialanine in the dialanyl dialanine molecule. Then you've got the carboxyl group, and then it's linked to the second dialanine. Okay, so here's the second dialanine's alpha carbon, the methyl group off the side, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and then the carboxyl group finally. Okay, so finally, that molecule, if I just cross out, um, well, I'll separate off this group here, so that's no longer there. That's gone off with the hydrogen from this um, amino group of this dialanyl dialanine. And the enzyme, basically, which um, binds uh, this dialanyl dialanine molecule to this n acetyl well, UDP, N-acetyl muramyl tripeptide, so I should have actually put that here, that should be UDP, N-acetyl muramyl uh, pentapeptide, and this should be UDP, N-acetyl muramyl tripeptide. Okay, uh, the enzyme which does that is just a ligase, basically. So there's a ligase enzyme which binds um, the uh, dialanyl dialanine molecule to the UDP N-acetyl muramyl tripeptide. Okay, right. So why was it important for me to painstakingly name all of these enzymes? Alanine race maze, uh, dialanyl dialanine synthetase, and then finally um, this ligase which binds dialanyl uh, dialanine onto our uh, UDP N acetyl muramyl tripeptide. Well, there is a drug which blocks them all, is believed to block them all anyway, and this drug is known as cycloserine, uh, uh, specifically D cycloserine. Okay, so D cycloserine. And the structure of D cycloserine is as follows it's a five membered ring, it has an oxygen up here a carbon down here, a nitrogen here, and then two carbons below, like so. So it's a five-membered ring with oxygen and nitrogen in, like, as follows. This nitrogen then has a hydrogen bound to it. This carbon has a double bond uh, to an oxygen, so you have a carbonyl group here. This carbon has an amino group bound off it down here, and also a hydrogen. And then finally, this carbon just has two hydrogens bound off it. Okay, so that's the structure of D-cycloserine. And basically, it's based on the structure of serine, the amino acid serine. As you can see here, if we sort of get rid of this bit here, you've kind of got the carboxyl group here of the amino acid, the alpha carbon here, the amino group down here, and here is kind of the R group of serine. What you've done is you've linked the carboxyl group to the uh, hydroxyl group of the R group through this um, nitrogen here, basically. All right, so that is the molecule of D-cycloserine, and D-cycloserine is believed to block this ligase which binds the dialanyl dialanine group here onto the UDP N-acetyl muramyl tripeptide here. It also, more famously, uh, blocks alanine racemase, or racemase, whatever you want to call it, and it also blocks the dialanyl dialanine synthetase. Uh, so cycloserine blocks all of these, basically. Okay, right, so that's another example of an important antibiotic which targets uh, the biosynthesis of the uh, peptidoglycan cell wall. And we'll continue this story in the next video.